forward to the challenge. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Wahda. Wa salaka bi nabiyyihi wa'ala. Wa nusallim wa nusallim ala habibihi al-Mustafa. Wa ala alihi wa man wala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa ta'ala wa barakatuh. So before we uh, get to the roast of, I mean, I'm sorry, the, the celebration of the life of it, I want to set a few uh, ground rules here. So for one, all this talking about, well, they're young, and maybe they're young, the age of 25, maybe not. Let me just say this. If you wake up in the morning and your body is not like a Star Wars figure, like generation one Star Wars figure that only bends at the waist of your young. Because when I wake up in the morning, I feel like Han Solo. I only, I'm like C-3PO. I only have like one joint. So you're young, mashallah. Uh, secondly, I'm a little bit terrified by the sister's introduction. So I'm obviously going to file a complaint with NSA. That has pulled all kinds of you know mysterious information uh, about me off of the internet. <laughs> pulling some stuff I don't even know about. <laughs> so alhamdulillah, we're here to be inspired. I personally have been inspired, and, and I hope I hope nobody takes offense that you know during uh, Imam Siraj's talk, I, I was on my phone and. I wasn't just like checking Facebook or whatnot. I mean, I did send out a couple of tweets because as the young, as the young ones uh, at Drexel used to call me the i man because I was fluent in technology. But I was just taking notes because uh, for me, every time I hear uh, certain people open their mouth like Imam Sarah Johaj, Dr. Jackson, Dr. Omar al any time certain people of a certain caliber, when they open up their mouth, I'm taking notes because there's always some benefit from it. And in that, obviously what the Sahaba Initiative is trying to do is just all about benefit. It's about benefit for now, but it's, as Brother Matt said, it's about benefiting uh, something for generations to come that will be a goal that will not be attained, attained uh, in our lifetimes, but hopefully will be carried on, the banner will be carried by our children and our grandchildren. And what they're trying to do is the Amru bin Ma'rufi wa Nahiz al-Munkar. And these terms in Arabic, Ma'ruf, you know, when you ask somebody, they say, oh, it's commanding to the good. But Ma'ruf doesn't really just mean good. Matter of fact, in the ayah that they recited, وَلْتَكُمْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ Khair means good. But ma'ruf means customarily what is known. And that's why it's opposite, as Allah uses it, munkar. Munkar just doesn't mean evil. And in fact, if we were to translate munkar into colloquial English, it would be like, what the heck? <laughs> No, seriously, like ajib. And sometimes in Arabic, it's ajib. Like, that's crazy. So when you are forbidding something, it's not that you're forbidding evil. This sounds like, you know, like a Sam Raimi movie, like Evil Dead or something. This is not what we're talking about. It's mokar means you're, 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 you're pushing back against something that's so repugnant that when you hear it, you go, what the heck is that? Like when he talked about, you know, there's a, a a case that was, that was adjudicated upon in which they said that an uncle could marry his niece. Our reaction is, what the heck is that? That is Munkar. Right? So what we're trying to do today is to reinforce and call to the good of the people know customarily. I mean, Ma'ruf has the same root as Ruf. And we have a maxim in Rasul al that we say, Al-Adatul Muhakkama, that, that that tradition or customs are given the weight of law, unless they obviously otherwise contradict something from the book or something from the sunnah. So we are really here to try to fulfill these broad based commands that we that we have from our book and that we have from our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And this is what Sahaba Initiative is carrying on. In this, 
as you get ready to get out your checkbook, because I know that's what you're about to do. In that, and I'm going to say this and take this in the spirit, and I'm not preaching to you. I'm actually hoping that you will take this and pass it along to other people, because in some ways I know I'm preaching to the choir right now. But also in the verse that Imam Saraj had mentioned, he said, you know, Allahu waliladhi, that Allah is the wali of those who believe and that they that Allah that Allah takes people from darkness to light. My thing is that yeah, mashallah, that's a very beautiful line, we understand it. My question is, are we as a Muslim community, and this is where we have to have we have to have serious conversations too. Are we getting in the way of Allah's light? Are we getting in the way of Allah's light being shown? And I'm not saying that to you because, alhamdulillah, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. You're here, so obviously you're trying to commit it. So what I'm saying is when we leave here, let's also have a broader conversation with the people that aren't here, that need to hear this. Because my thing is this, Allah will not stand anybody to get in the way of his light. That is the story that we get from Musa and Fir'aun. That ultimately Fir'aun wanted to try to stand in the way of Allah's light. Allah will not have it. He will tolerate no tabut and no bulam on the earth. As Allah says also, Allah doesn't want any kind of dhulam, any kind of injustice, any oppression inflicted upon any of the worlds. So unless we are actively, it's kind of like, really in some ways, Allah is giving us kind of a parable, either you're with me or you're against it. Alhamdulillah, Sahaba initiative is here, that they are obviously with Allah in the idea of they're trying to bring good to people's lives. So I, I ask, I make a challenge. Are we... Do we have enough hubris? Do we have enough arrogance that we will try to stand in the way of Allah's light? And if so, do we think we will be able to withstand those that were ashad them in uwa minna, those that were more powerful than us that came before, that failed, Allah will not tolerate this. So we are here today to try to also wake up the rest of our community, to come to the senses and to see that the things that Sahaba Initiative is trying to do is in the best interest of everybody, and it's ultimately in the interest of God. As Dr. Jackson had said actually recently, he said, hey, you know, half of our problem is not ilm. MashaAllah, we have a lot of knowledge in our community. Most of our problem is courage. We lack the courage and the conviction to carry through. And that's what I'm most impressed by, by these young, flexible people, that they have the courage to not only just, just to step up to the plate, but they also have the courage to swim. And what we have to do is come behind them and support them. Some of them, from time to time, they may hit a two-base run. Maybe even, you know, they can hit a home run. But that's just stats, right? The thing is, are we playing the game to win? And we have to be there to support them. You know, I come from Detroit, so believe me, Tigers fans know all about just support. <laughs> you know, because when was the last time we won a World Series? So uh, as somebody that comes from a, a, a city that, that puts basically the winning and losing, uh, Detroit, that, you know, we have to support them. And that it's not about looking for the, for the home run every time. What they're doing is going gonna, gonna to take accretion over time to succeed, inshallah. And lastly, I'll leave you with these words. And I want, again, to contemplate this, and if you can, have this conversation when we leave this room. I want to ask a question, and hopefully I'll get some kind of answer. And some of you will say, ah, I know you said this before. Well, you know, I have one trick, and here it is. So, when did Muslims come to America? During slavery. When did Muslims come to America? Any other theories out there? Long before that. Long before, so before Columbus. <laughs> In the beginning of the century. So the Muslims came to America through slavery, before Columbus and all that. So I would like 
somebody in this room to raise their hand that is a descendant of the Muslims that came before Columbus or is a descendant of the Muslims that came as slaves as an unbroken chain. So I ask again, when did Islam, when did the Muslims come to America? Which is really, when did Islam come to America? If we know that they came before Columbus but they didn't make it, and if we know that they came with the slaves and they didn't make it, then when did Islam come to America? Yeah, but they're not here now. That, that chain was broken, right? So that's my point. That chain, that, that's true. It's a, that's a historical fact that is having an impact on what's here today. So I'll very quickly connect the dots because I can see everybody's going to be like walking dead if they don't get something to eat. <laughs> there were a couple of very important events that happened right around the 1960s and 70s that's going to tell you when Islam came to America. So one, for lack of a better descriptive word, Muslims of an immigrant persuasion came to the Americas roughly in the early to mid 1960s due to the Immigration Act and a couple other things that opened up large quotas from the historical Muslim world to come to America. And some people will demonize these people, which, you know, they say, oh, well, these people came here for dunya and they came here for this and that. I'm still waiting to find somebody that came here for Africa. So, <laughs> I'm not about all this nonsense about dunya, you know? Allah actually says in the Quran, وَلَنْتَنْ سَنَصِيبَةً مِنَ الدُّنْيَا وَأَحْسَنْ كَأَحْسَنَ اللَّهِ إِلَيْهِ Right? Don't forget your portion of this world and do excellent as Allah has been excellent to you. This is in our book. So I'm not demonizing people about dunya. So we know that's when large numbers of Muslims came to America. Also, large numbers of Muslims appeared in America after a very important event by name by a man whose name was, can you think of it? Who might be? Far. Not far, but you're very close. Lord. Elijah, Elijah, cool. You're, you're on the right track. Elijah, 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 Elijah. Malcolm X. Elijah, Elijah. See, this is what's interesting. Malcolm, you know, Humphrey was an amazing figure, but Malcolm didn't really live long enough to have a deep impact on Islam in America. I hope people won't find it offensive. I, deep, I have a lot of love for Malcolm. Like many people, you know, read his autobiography and find it very inspiring. There's another man. Elijah Muhammad. You're really, really close. There's another man whose name, unfortunately, is not common enough in the mouths of the Muslims, and that is Waikuddin Muhammad, known as Wallace Muhammad. Now, why am I mentioning Walid Fadid Muhammad? And I want to give a disclaimer. I did not come into Islam for the WD community. I was never in the nation of Islam, so I don't have any agenda here. Why is WD Muhammad so important? What did he do? He mainstreamed the nation. See, there's like one dude with all the answers. <laughs> so everybody but Joe can give an answer. He was one of the greatest Examples of great massive conversion to Islam. Ah, see, but it's like, but he's cheating. It's Imam Sarah Sahar. It's like Alex Trebek. Like on the other side of the Isle of Jeopardy. He knows it all. It's rigged. So he's right, but he's cheating. So, okay, yeah. One of the things that many people don't acknowledge is the dark Islam movement in the United States. There was, there was Muslims like Imam I mean, uh, uh, Abdul Hafiz, who's the first chaplain in, in, uh, in the federal prison in Terminal Island. They were following the Sunnah while the Nation of Islam were uh, uh, fought doing their thing. They were in the 1960s wearing probes and sandals in New York City. And people don't give them credit. A lot of the people that are, that are Muslim today did not go to the Nation of Islam. They went to Dar Islam. Right, no, actually one of the guys that I met right after I took Shahada himself was from Harlem, came out of the dark of the Islam movement, and that's why I initially kind of learned some of my Islam thing. But my major point, while that's true, Imam W. B. Muhammad was responsible for the largest mass conversion of Westerners into the religion of Islam. That's what it was. So, when that happened, at right around the tail end of the 60s to the 70s, you essentially have two streams of Muslims coming to America, one from the historical Muslim world through immigration, and one 
almost like popping up like clovers out of the ground, like just boom. What was the backdrop of the 60s that was going on in America? So, hold on, hold on. Somebody said civil rights? Civil rights. Oh, you mean state-sponsored terrorism and violence against its own citizens. What do you mean civil rights? Civil rights is a, is a legislative act that came later. But my father grew up in Jim Crow, Georgia, where they lynched and hung American citizens who were black. And it was essentially state-sponsored violence. That is what you have going on. We call it civil rights. That's a, that shows you how sterilized the, the, the true history has been. So you have that going on. What else was going on in the 60s? Nothing? That was it? Just the Beatles? Vietnam. Yeah. Viet, Viet, what? Yeah. Vietnam. And what was Vietnam? Oh, well, but what was Vietnam? Uh, have you ever heard of the Gulf of Tonkin? Yeah, yeah. What was it? You man, so that was can you help us out? I'm sorry to interrupt you there. It looks delicious too. It looks I like that waving that comes over when you got the fork in your mouth. How are you doing, sir? How was your meal? And it would sound like Charlie Brown. Wah, 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 wah. What was the Gulf of Tonkin? Okay. The Gulf of Tonkin was the incident that started the Vietnam War, but it was based on what? A lie. And this is not conspiracy. This is this is in your textbooks. This is right. So we have, a, and then on top of the Vietnam War, what else do we have going on? Anybody heard of Woodstock? What was Woodstock? Some music. What were hippies? Tune in and tune out. Tune in and tune out. Right. So you had a massive moral shift away from American traditional conservatism that despite Jim Crow still at least had some more platitudes, right? I mean, in terms of uh, what was acceptable uh, moral sexual behavior, X, Y, and Z. Essentially, by the time you get to the mid to late 60s, all of this collapses. America's moral integrity, its moral compass, everything completely collapses in America. And now I ask you again, when did Islam come to America? At this exact time. The whole reason why I'm telling you this is so that you can see purpose in your existence here in America. If you want to make a buck, if you want to make two, if you want to make ten million, do that I don't have any problem with you. As people know, I love me some suits and ties. So I don't have any problem with making money. And our religion doesn't demonize people. You know, at least half of the ten that were promised paradise were wealthy. So Islam doesn't have any issue with money. But we came here at a time, or more appropriately, Allah put the Muslims in America at a time where it had totally forgot its moral compass. And we are here. As he said, as the Imam said earlier, right? What's in your book? We are here at a time to remind people of A, the nature of reality, that existence is not meaningless, and that we do have a responsibility to communal good. And that is what the Sahaba Initiative is all about. And that's why I know, inshallah, that you will sit, that you will give generously. But again, seriously, when we leave here, Try to spark a conversation with those that you know, whether they contribute directly to Sahaba Initiative or not, but that they understand that our existence here in America, we have been blessed and sent here by none other than the Rabbi Samawad The Lord of the heavens and the earth has put us here for a purpose. If we get a few other things along the way, that's fine, but we are here to do things. And 
It's very obvious that Imam Siraj Wahaj, may Allah bless him, understands that his life has essentially been a reenactment of understanding that we are here for the purpose. He has now passed that baton along to the Sahaba Initiative. May Allah bless them, inshallah, and give them tawfiq in all of their endeavors. Jazakum Allah khayran. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.